Welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School Lesson for Sunday, May 31st, 2020. We're still in Unit 3. Uh, the title of Unit 3 is Call to God's Work of Justice. Call to God's Work of Justice from the Faith Pathway Adult Quarterly. We're in Lesson 14 and our lesson title is Measure Up measure up. Our devotional reading is taken from Deuteronomy chapter 8 verses 11 to 20. Our background scripture taken from Hosea chapters 11 and 12. And our printed or lesson passage or lesson text is Hosea chapter 11 verses 1 and 2 and then 7 to 10 and then chapter 12 verses 1 and 2, and verses 6 to 14. Our key verse is verse chapter 12, verse 6, and it is, Turn thou to thy God, keep mercy and judgment, and wait on thy God continually. From the Adult Quarterly, our lesson aims or number one, Compare prosperity as a worldly goal with the godly virtues of love and justice. Number two, regret occasions when one has adopted prosperity as a key goal. And then number three, practice love and justice as key virtues. And we will learn, hopefully, as we get into our lesson discussion that those are key characteristics or key virtues of God, which certainly we want to emulate or imitate. The quarterly has lesson has three major divisions after the introduction. The first is an ungrateful child. That's covered between chapter 11, verses 1, 2, and 7. The second is a compassionate father, as covered between chapter 11, verses 8 and 10. And the third is an irrevocable indictment, and that's covered between chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, and then 6 to 14. From the standard commentary, our lesson title is Pursue Love and Justice. Pursue love and justice. And very quickly, additional aims or from the standard or number one, identify Israel's problem. Uh, this is the northern kingdom, Israel, we're talking about. But we'll see in our lesson text that he talks about the entirety of uh, the nation, northern and southern uh, kingdoms. Number two, explain whether the predicted consequences that the problem better fit the concept of restorative justice or that of retributive justice or retributive justice. And we'll get uh, a better understanding of that as we get into the text. And then number three, identify one or more modern parallels to elements of the text and develop responses. We're going to focus on the aims from the quarterly, from the adult quarterly, and uh, specifically on uh, the virtues of the godly, the godly virtues of love and justice as we go through our lesson discussion. So before we get into um, our first passage, our first division, let's... Uh, Let's go before the throne. Uh, Father, we do thank and praise you for another opportunity to study your precious word. Lord, we know that you know all about what's going on in our world and in our individual lives, Lord, and we know that you are fully in control. We thank you for the, the, the peace that you've given us in the midst of this great storm and this pandemic, this worldwide pandemic, and we trust that all your children are resting in your peace, Lord. We ask your blessings upon those who've been impacted, Lord, physically, Lord, uh, by this dread disease, those who've had family members who've been impacted, we ask for your healing touch 
And Lord, we ask for your, again, for your wisdom and your guidance for all those who are on the front lines, those who, uh, uh, who, are, who are our leaders, Lord, local, state, and federal, and worldwide leaders, Lord. We pray that you would give them godly wisdom, Lord. But we pray that you would accomplish your will through this dread disease and that you would get the glory somehow, Lord, that many souls would turn to you in faith, Lord, recognizing that you are fully in control. And now, Lord, as we, we get into this lesson today, Lord, we pray that you'd give us a clear understanding of your word. And Lord, as we understand it, increase our faith and our obedience. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to read our first passage from the Adult Quarterly. Uh, and again, this division, the division of the this uh, Adult Quarterly lesson is entitled, An Ungrateful Child. I'm going to read from the NIV. Um, I found the King James Version, which I really love. I love the old... Uh, uh, Oxford English, uh, but I found some of the verses a little difficult to understand in the King James and much more clear in the NIV. So I'm going to read 1 and 2 and 7. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. But the more they were called, the more they went away from me. They sacrificed to the Baals. And they burn incense to images. Verse 7. My people are determined to turn from me. Even though they call me God Most High, I will by no means exalt them. And I'm going to back up. Uh, I, I did not give any background <laughs> on our lesson text or um, the prophet Hosea. So I'd like to take just a just a minute and do that. Um, all we know about the prophet Hosea, uh, for the most part, there is some mention in Chronicles, Second Chronicles, of him. And most of what we know about him is actually contained in the the book uh, by his name. Uh, he is one of the minor prophets, uh, not because of the importance of his writing, but uh, the volume of his writing. Uh, he was a contemporary of of Isaiah uh, and prophesied, depending on which commentator you read, he prophesied uh, between around 655 uh, B.C. to uh, some say 710 B.C. Uh, that, that would have been after the Northern Kingdom exile. Uh, some say 725 but uh, most likely he ended his prophecy to the northern kingdom, which he was from, and his prophecies were primarily to the northern kingdom in 722 uh, when the uh, uh, northern kingdom was taken captive by the Assyrians. Uh, and he actually uh, uh, prophesied during the reigns of Uzziah, uh, Jotham, uh, Ahaz and Hezekiah and Judah, and uh, th during the reign of Jeroboam the uh, second in the northern kingdom, and uh, he uh, prophesied again, as I said, primarily to the northern kingdom. And during the reign of Jeroboam the uh, second, the northern kingdom experienced a material prosperity. Uh, Jeroboam the second was a strong king. Uh, and he had expanded the borders of the northern kingdom, uh, and they were prospering uh, financially, and uh, it was only after his death that the northern kingdom started to fall into chaos uh, with uh, uh, kings uh, that succeeded him being assassinated by their successors. There were four out of the next six kings that were assassinated, after uh, Jeroboam died. While the northern kingdom was prospering outwardly, there was spiritual decay uh, and decadence. They were, of course, uh, abusing uh, the weak and the poor. They were worshiping and serving idols. Uh, the Baals, which is plural for 
Baal, and that was, uh, uh, there were many gods of the surrounding people that were called that. And so they were showing uh, real disregard for the true and living God, despite the fact that he uh, was the one responsible for their prosperity. <clears throat> and so through um, Hosea, uh, God first gave a, a pretty uh, dramatic living example. The first three uh, chapters of Isaiah uh, basically cover the period that I think we're most familiar with, and that's when uh, God instructed uh, Hosea to marry a certain woman, uh, Goma, Goma rather, who if she wasn't before, uh, she became a harlot uh, while they were married, and that uh, their life, his domestic life with her, really dramatized the sin and unfaithfulness of Israel, and uh, and also uh, God's forgiveness. Uh, it was a metaphor for the entire. I mean, it really helped to clarify the theme of the entire book. Uh, it it really typifies the sin uh, of Israel and the forgiving love of God, the judgment and the forgiving love of God. But toward the uh, uh, the last four chapters of uh, Hosea uh, deal with 11 through 14, uh, really deal with uh, really God pouring out uh, his love, reminding Israel of how much he loves uh, uh, them despite their sin. Uh, however, he does. Uh, uh, he does speak of the judgment that they have uh, rightly earned, at, and at this point is inevitable. However, he speaks of a time beyond the judgment uh, when he is going to uh, once again express his his love for them and his compassion for them. So, with that as a little background, let's let's get into our our lesson text. Um, so verse 1 of chapter 11 reads, When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called him, and called rather, my son out of Egypt. Uh, that was from the King James Virgin, by the way. So, what, so what's he talking about then? He is uh, reminding uh, Israel of when uh, he... Uh, declared them as his people and declared them as his his son. As a matter of fact, if we go back to uh, uh, Exodus chapter 4, when he told uh, Pharaoh, he said, uh, Israel is my son, my firstborn. And he said, "Let my I'm paraphrasing, let my firstborn uh, leave and, and, and come out and worship me. Otherwise, I will destroy your firstborn. But anyway, so he is reminding them of when he established the relationship with the nation Israel when he actually established them as a nation now he had already established a covenant with Abraham their father but he established them as a nation when he brought them out of Egypt and when he gave them the law at Mount Sinai verse 2 says but the more they were called well, let me back up um, we know also that Verse um, verse one of eleven is also quoted in Matthew uh, chapter two verse fifteen uh, out of it, where it says it is written out of out of Egypt I call my son in reference to Jesus calling Jesus out of Israel now and we know that uh, prophecies uh, very often have a short term. A fulfillment and a longer term fulfillment and the ultimate fulfillment is was he called his his love his his one and only son the ultimate expression of his love out of Egypt uh, and back into uh, to Israel to fulfill the purpose for which he uh, became incarnate came to earth that was to die for our sins uh, so let's move on to uh, much more could be said about that, but uh, I just did want to make that point. Um, chapter, verse 2 says, But the more they were called, the more they went away from me. They sacrificed to the Baals, and they burned incense to, image, 
to images. So God is has called them. He called them initially out of Egypt. He's continued to call them. Later on in our lesson text, we'll see where he talks about having sent prophets. Excuse me. But God has been speaking to them through prophets since Moses, since he brought them out. And he'll he'll speak about Moses as well, uh, using him to lead them out of Egypt. Uh, and so he says the more he calls, the more basically they ignore him and they are sacrificing or worship sacrificing and worshiping other gods when, when they sacrifice and burn incense that means that they're worshiping idols false gods of the surrounding heathen and and i i've spoken about this before um to my sunday school class at church i know we're in the virtual world now uh but one of the attractions and perhaps the, the greatest attraction to the heathen God is that they were basically sensual in nature. Uh, they uh, worship gods of fertility and, and, and they uh, believed that uh, uh, orgies were a form of worship. Uh, uh, and, 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 and a lot of heathen incorporated sexual acts into their worship service. So there was a fleshly enticement to uh, serve and worship these other gods. Now, as we go through our lesson text, we're going to see where there it appears that they're giving some lip service to the true God, but they're they're not really uh, worshiping him. They may be mouthing words. They may be going through the motion, perhaps making sacrifices to him as well, but their hearts are far from them, from him rather. Let's move on. Second division of our lesson uh, is entitled a compassionate father verses 8 to 10 again from the niv how can i give you up ephraim how can i hand you over israel how can i treat you like adma how can i make you like zeboyan my heart is changed within me all my compassion is aroused I will not carry out my fierce anger, nor will I devastate Ephraim again. For I am God and not man, the Holy One among you. I will not come against their cities. Uh, verse 10. They will follow the Lord. He will roar like a lion. When he roars, his children will come trembling from the west. So let's back up to verse 8, and again it reads, How can I, and this is the Lord speaking again uh, through Hosea in a reflective way, okay? He's saying, How can I give you up Ephraim? And Ephraim is just another uh, name used for Israel. It is uh, the largest tribe of Israel. Uh, the northern kingdom, and therefore he was referring to Israel, the northern kingdom, uh, off and on as Ephraim. And he uses a little poetic, poetic language here uh, in couplets, and that was to give emphasis to what was being said when something is repeated in a slightly different way. So he says, how can I give you up Ephraim or forsake you? How can I hand you over Israel, okay, meaning the same thing. Israel and Ephraim meaning the same thing. Uh, now, what's he talking about? How can I forsake you forever? Now, we know their fate is, is sealed as far as the Assyrian uh, captivity. Uh, uh, it, 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 it appears that Hosea is prophesying approximately 30 years before 722 B.C. when the Assyrians uh, basically take the northern kingdom captive. And then he, he, he goes on to say, he says, how can I treat you like Adma? How can I make you like Zeboian? Well, what, what's Adma? What's Zeboian? Well, well, those were sister cities to so Sodom and Gomorrah. They were in the plain and they were destroyed along with Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, if 
There's one thing you remember about Sodom and Gomorrah is that they were utterly destroyed, never to be rebuilt again, right? So he's saying, uh, how can I utterly destroy you like I did these cities, these sister cities to Sodom and Gomorrah? And again, he could have said Sodom and Gomorrah, but it's, again, a little poetic language here, a different way of saying the same thing. He said, my heart is changed within me. He says, all my compassion is aroused. Now, this is a little difficult to explain because God doesn't change his mind. He's immutable. He doesn't repent. Uh, he, uh, But he uses in expressing emotions what is called anthropomorphic language or anthropomorphism. And that is putting expressions into human terms or terms that we can understand. And he is trying to express his emotions, uh, uh, but he is nothing surprises him. Uh, he, he doesn't change his mind about anything, but he wants us to understand how he feels about uh, what's going on with the Northern Kingdom. And how, when he said he's aroused, his compassion, his love, and his his mercy, his tendency to to be merciful is aroused at the same time. And 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 if you've been in love before, you know that it's a, you can have mixed emotions. You know, uh, sometimes you have to to say something in love uh, because you love someone, but you know that. Uh, it's going to cause perhaps some disappointment in the person that you say it to. Uh, so he has mixed emotions here. He, he knows that judgment must be carried out, but he also wants to to be compassionate. And, and that's why he says his, his compassion, his mercy, his love is aroused in him. Verse 9, I will not carry out my fierce anger, nor will I devastate Ephraim again. For I am God and not man, the Holy One among you. I will not come against their cities. And that's translated a little differently uh, elsewhere. As a matter of fact, it says, um, well, 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 we'll go with this, with this translation here. Uh, what is he saying here? He's saying... He won't carry out his fierce anger, and that is to utterly destroy them, to utterly devastate them. Okay, and again, he's talking about Ephraim, uh, which is a, another way of saying uh, Israel. Again, all right, where does the again come in? Okay, <laughs> the again comes in after the judgment that is pending, that's imminent. And that is the Assyrians are going to take them captive and disperse them. Later on, he's going to talk about gathering them from the West. In fact, I think it's the very next verse. So when he says again, he means after this judgment that they have basically sealed for themselves. They've been uh, impenitent and they have not uh, and they've dis uh, disregarded uh, the prophets that God has sent them. Uh, and now uh, they are, uh, what he's speaking of is a time beyond this immediate judgment. As he did when he spoke to Judah through the various prophets he sent them about the time beyond the Babylonian captivity. And I, before we go to before we go to verse 10, I want to back up to 7, verse 7 for just a minute and Again, reread that. It says, my people are determined to turn from me, even though they call me God most high, I will by no means exalt them. And again, depending on which translation you read, some say exalt him. I'm, I'm sorry. When he says, I will by no means exalt them, he is basically saying he is not going to uh, uh, basically uh, excuse them. He's not going to relieve them of this impending judgment or not going to uh, to um, prevent or avoid, if you will, uh, 
this judgment, if you suspend this judgment, I'm trying to think of a better word to say it when he says he's not going to exalt him. He's not going to deliver them from this impending judgment. And I think that helps us understand uh, verse 9 a little better. So verse 10 says, They shall walk after the Lord. They shall roar. He shall roar like a lion. When he shall roar, then the children shall tremble from the west. Uh, I'm going to read that. Actually, it reads pretty much the same in the NIV. They will follow the Lord. He will roar like a lion. When he roars, his children will, will tremble from the west. They will come trembling, rather, from the west. So first of all, what does it mean they're going to walk after the Lord? Well, this, uh, this judgment is going to result in uh, what is called restorative discipline. This is restorative disciplining. You know, when uh, your parent corrected you because you, uh, because you disobeyed them, uh, then you became disciplined and obeyed them, hopefully, uh, going forward, at least until the next time you were foolish enough to disobey. Uh, now, that's different from uh, the retributive. You know, retributive is, is more punitive as punishment versus restorative uh, uh, justice or judgment. And that is intended, of course, to correct and so that's what they will have been corrected is what he's saying here. And he says, he will roar like a lion. Well, when a lion roars, uh, it suggests a couple of things. Number one, uh, you know, he's, uh, you know, it, it, it strikes fear in the heart. Certainly he is able to, to punish. He's able to inflict uh, pain. Uh, uh, and then uh, also uh, he's a great protector but in this context, the lion's roar actually is a sign for Israel to return home. Uh, his, his roar signals a time for them to return. And as we read further, it says uh, they're going to come trembling. His children are going to come trembling from the west. Well, uh, you might ask, you know, why would they tremble? I mean, they 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 will tremble as a, as a bird out of Egypt. Uh, verse eleven of chapter eleven says that's not in our our lesson text. It says they shall come trembling like a bird from Egypt, like a dove from the land of Assyria, and I will let them dwell in their houses, saith the Lord. Uh, so they're going to be, uh, again, uh, they will have been uh, punished, uh, not punished. They will have been judged, rightfully so, for their sins. And they will come back with the appropriate humility at the sound of the lion's roar. And that brings us to our third division uh, in the lesson, which is entitled An Irrevocable Indictment. We just read about a compassionate father. That was our second division. And this division uh, covers verses, uh, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, and verses 6 to 14. Uh, I'm going to take 1 and 2 first. Uh, and it says, and again from the NIV, it reads, And Jacob fled into the country of Syria, and Israel served for a wife, and for a while, uh, I'm reading the KJV. Let me back up. Ephraim feeds on the winds. This is verse 1 of chapter 12. He pursues the east wind all day and multiplies lies and violence. He makes a treaty with Assyria and sends olive oil to Egypt. The Lord has a charge to bring against Judah. He will punish Jacob according to his ways and repay him according to his deeds. All right, now what's he saying in uh, verse 1 of chapter 12? 
Well, again, Ephraim uh, means is another name for Israel, and he is the, or the northern kingdom, and he's saying that it is feeding on the wind. Now, if you're <laughs> if you're feeding on the wind, what is that? What's another way of saying that? Uh, you're actually feeding on nothing, on thin air. And he says he pursues the east wind all the day. He chases the wind all day and multiplies lies and violence. He makes a treaty with Assyria and sends olive oil to Egypt. So what's he comparing these alliances with Israel, I'm sorry, with uh, Assyria and Egypt to? That's what he's talking about, uh, uh, and and the, and and those alliances have been made for protection. You know the. Sorry about that. Yeah, the Northern Kingdom has made alliances with Syria uh, that will be that they'll later find out will be the worst thing they could have possibly done. Uh, because Assyria is going to turn around and, of course, take them captive. Uh, not thirty years from from this from this time, uh, and Egypt for protection, and the protection that God wants them to seek Him for. Uh, and He's saying, uh, basically, your treaties are useless, as useless as the thin air. Your alliances are as useless as the thin air. Are chasing the wind. They are not going to protect you. As a matter of fact, God uses uh, one of the nations that they uh, thought would provide protection to them to judge them, Assyria. And verse 2 says, the Lord has a charge to bring against Judah. Uh, the King James says, a controversy. And this is like uh, a, um, a legal uh claim uh, against them. They have actually broken a contract. They breached the contract. And so the Lord has a case, a legal case against them. He says he will punish Jacob according to his way and repay him according to his deeds. Now, when he speaks of Jacob here, there, there are a few things going on here. Number one, he's speaking about, um, uh, I'm sorry, the entirety of of the nation Israel, the northern and the southern kingdom. He, he's already mentioned Judah. He said, the Lord has a, a charge. Uh, the Lord has a charge to bring against Judah. Now, that's the southern kingdom. And he says he will punish Jacob. That's the entirety, the northern and the southern kingdom, according to his uh, ways and repay him according to his deeds. Now, uh, we know that Israel, the northern kingdom, uh, was was just a step ahead of the southern kingdom, Judah, in terms of their their downward spiral, their uh, idolatry in particular, and their injustice uh, and uh, just their their spiritual depravity uh, from the very first king to the very last king. Uh, Judah had a few kings that actually slowed the downward spiral. Hezekiah being one. Uh, Josiah being another. Now, I, hopefully you read uh, all of chapter 12 because in the verses between verse 2 and 6, uh, verse uh, he talks about more about what Jacob did. Actually, Jacob, the the man, the patriarch, Jacob, he said, he, uh, verse 3 says he took his brother by the heel in the womb, in other words, he was a usurper, you know, he said he, and he, uh, <clears throat> in his strength, he struggled with God, yes, he struggled with the angel, and prevailed, he wept, and saw favor from him, he found him in Bethel, and there he spoke to us, so he, he, he go, he reviews him coming to know Jacob, who was a patriarch of the, of the 12 tribes, and he, and he comes down to verse 6, and he says, and I'm going to read, well, let me just take it a verse at a time from this point. He says, but you must return to your God, maintain love and justice and wait for your God always. So 
he is saying uh, he recognizes uh, the beginning, uh, how they began when they were a child, and how he, he brought them out of Egypt. And, and, and he's, he's let them know uh, throughout this passage how, how much he loved them, how his compassion, his mercy has been aroused, even though uh, they've, they've, they've sinned against him greatly. Uh, they've committed whoredoms. Uh, uh, they've they've uh, gone uh, seeking other uh, whoredoms with other gods. Because of that, because of his righteousness, because God is perfectly just, he has to judge that. He has to judge that, but he still loves them. And, and this is something that I think we need to understand today. You know, um, I certainly hope that everyone listening uh, to this lesson knows the Lord, knows for sure that they know the Lord and the pardon of their sins. Uh, and I certainly hope that you're reaching out to others that don't or may have some questions about their salvation. But the Lord is going to love sinners and and righteous folk or justified folk uh, until uh, he calls the, the one home and until the other go go to hell, eternally separated from him. He's going to love sinners to hell. You know, he loves them. He said, you know, John 3, 16, he said, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son to whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And Second Peter three nine says, you know, God is 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 not willing that any should perish. You know, he he is not willing that any should perish. So God does not want us to perish, and he and he's done uh, the greatest thing that he could do as an expression of his love, and that's to send his one and only Son to to bear our sin burden on the cross, and he will love us to the end. But there will be an end, and all need to recognize that. So when, when verse 6 says that God tells, tells them that they must return to him and maintain love and justice and wait for him. All right, what's he mean by that? Well, first of all, love and justice, or as I mentioned earlier, uh, two of the, 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 the key virtues of God. Uh, he is both merciful and just. And we... We, we we have to, um, I'm, I'm sure, scratch our heads sometimes as to how that could be, how he could be merciful and just. And I would direct you to Romans chapter 3, verses 21 to 26. 26 says, he is both the just and the justifier. You know, in order for God to be perfectly holy and, and, and righteous, he has to be just. And that means that all sin is going to be paid for. Uh, I, I say this to the uh, to the prisoners in our prison ministry uh, very often. Uh, all sin is going to be paid for. If God is perfectly holy and perfectly just, that means that all sin must be paid for. However, he's also merciful. Uh, he's tenderhearted. He's loving. And so, how, how do you how do you square those? How do you reconcile those two? How can he be the just and the justifier? Well. He satisfied his need for justice by sinning, by bearing our sins on the cross himself. He sent his one and only son, God incarnate, to bear our sins on the cross. So it comes down to a simple, a simple question. Are you going, uh, two questions, I should say. Are you going to pay your own sin debt because all sin is going to be paid for? Or are you going to accept the, the, the payment already made for your your sins by Jesus Christ. And when you make it that simple, it's really difficult to say, no, I'm going to pay my, my own sin debt. Some people need to be reminded is eternal separation from the love and even the common grace of God that we enjoy in this life. For he makes his sun to shine and his rain to fall on the just and the unjust in this life. We have common grace, but when we're eternally separated from God, and Jesus gave some of the most graphic descriptions of that uh, the, in the Bible, uh, where there's eternal darkness, weeping and gnashing of teeth, where the worm uh, doesn't die and the fire is not quenched, and, and on and on and on. And it's a horrible place of separation from God's, even as I said, common grace. So as God... Uh, <clears throat> 
as those are two of God's key virtues, he wants them to be our key virtues as well. He wants us to be to practice justice, and that is to do right by all, weak and the strong by all, and love, mercy, compassion. And that is not uh, uh, an emotion so much as it is an action. Uh, we want to be moved to help others as God gives us means and opportunity. Verse 7, the merchants use dishonest scales and love to defraud. Okay, this is this was typical of the uh, of, of some of the sins that they were practicing in the northern kingdom. You know, yeah, they were getting rich and they boast of that. We'll see that in the next verse. But how are they getting rich? They don't care how they're getting rich. They're they're defrauding uh, and they're and they're boasting or happy uh, to defraud. Uh, verse eight says. Ephraim, again, Israel, or the northern kingdom, boasts, I am very rich. I have become wealthy. With all my wealth, they will not find me uh, in any, uh, find in me, rather, any iniquity or sin. Now, they have become deluded. I mean, it's become the the, the uh, wickedness or de de deception uh, has become so common practice, uh, they don't even see it as sin anymore. They have become so uh, so self-deluding, they don't recognize that they're actually offending God or sinning against Him. And and and, and I want to look over at uh, Revelation chapter three, verse seventeen, and and it says, "Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have." need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. This is the state that they're in. They don't know the spiritual poverty that they're in because of the material wealth that has blinded them, that they've gotten uh, uh, probably more often than not by, uh, by illegal means or deceptive means. Verse 9. I have been the Lord, your God, ever since you came out of Egypt. I will make you live in tents again, and in the days of your appointed, uh, as rather, in the days of your appointed festivals. Well, he's saying he's the Lord, all caps, self-existent one, Jehovah, the self-existent one, and he's been ever since they came out of Egypt. And again, uh, he was their Lord before then, actually, but he established them as a nation when they came out of Egypt. Actually, he was he made a covenant with their their forefather, Abraham, and he told Abraham about his seed and how they were going to how he was going to multiply his seed. Uh, and uh, anyway, when he brought them out and gave them the law at Mount Sinai, he established them as a nation and he told them they were his peculiar people his peculiar treasure and now he's saying he's been with them since then and he says he's going to make them to live in tents again so what does that mean well during the wilderness some 40 years in the wilderness they dwelt in tents and if we read all the verses in our background uh text uh, we read about how God preserved them, how he fed them manna and gave them water out of rocks while they were in the wilderness. And, 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 and the wilderness was a difficult, horrible place to be with fiery serpents. He mentions that as well. But he says um, uh, he's going to make them dwell in tents again. And they they actually... Israel, and I'm not sure how... Uh, the northern kingdom, or if they practice it, but uh, the nascent Israel was supposed to observe uh, a week-long uh, observance uh, where they lived in tents. It was called the Feast of Tabernacles, where they actually lived in, in booths or, or, or huts uh, outside for a week to remember uh, God's protection uh, in the wilderness. And, and and actually, we can go back to Leviticus chapter 23, verses 33 to 36 and 39 to 43, and it describes that. And what God is saying here is 
you know, he is going to put them in tents again. And, and, and I believe uh, the, the correct interpretation of this could be wrong is that they're going to be in tents during the exile. The Assyrians are going to take them away captive. Obviously, during the transport, which is going to take weeks, months, they're going to be in tents and perhaps in tents for long after that. But if 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 it's only symbolic, if it's only to be in sub, a, a, a symbol of them being in the wilderness or out of their land and away from their homes, he is speaking of the exile uh, that they are about to experience. Verse 10, I spoke to the prophets, gave them many visions and told parables through them. Now, uh, God did speak. He had been speaking to them since Moses. He spoke to them directly and plainly through Moses and many other prophets. But through others, he gave visions. He spoke in parables. As a matter of fact, next couple of verses are going to really involve some parables or riddles, if you will, that the Lord speaks through to get his message to the people. And he's the verse, so verse 11 says, is Gilead wicked? And these are rhetorical questions, by the way. Is the people, its people are worthless? Do they sacrifice bulls in Gilgal? Their altars will be piles of stone on a plowed, plowed field. Now, so he is he's speaking this is kind of a, a riddle here but he's getting the point across uh about two cities with that were focal points of idol uh idol worship if you will there was a uh, a major uh pagan uh shrine in in Gilgal you can read about that in Hosea 4:14 4, and 15 and also Amos 4 and 4 and uh uh, and in Hosea 6, 6, 8, uh, we read, Gilead is a city of evildoers and defiled with blood. So that was, a, that was a, again, a, an idolatrous uh, focal point or center as well. Uh, and uh, so he is asking the, rhetor the rhetorical questions. And, and actually, uh, they're very familiar with uh, what's going on in these cities. But the Lord said is saying that these idols, these stone idols are going to be broken up and basically piled up in the in the fields that they are that they've been enjoying uh, abundant harvests from. Uh, they're going to be, uh, these idols are going to be plowed into the field, if you will, or found in the, the furrows uh, uh, in the field, which, of course, will make them unfruitful and, and unprofitable. Verse 12, Jacob fled to the country of Aram. Israel served to get a wife and to pay for her. He tended sheep. Now, Jacob here, we're flipping again uh, between Jacob and Israel, both the same name. Uh, and Jacob, of course, was the uh, patriarch of the, the, the 12 tribes. And you remember after he deceived uh, his father, Isaac, uh, and received the blessing, he fled from his brother Esau to Aram, uh, seeking safety there, and only to find uh, his... Uh, his uncle, uh, his uncle Laban, who was a bigger deceiver than him, he actually had him serve some fourteen years for for Rachel, his uh, his first love, his true love, uh, and so he is he is recounting uh, what what Jacob did, and ultimately we know Jacob had to flee. Uh, from Aram for from Laban for fear that he would take everything that he had and and just as uh, 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 Israel or the northern kingdom will find no uh, uh, no protection uh, no lasting protection 
uh, in with their, through their alliances with is, uh, Assyria and Egypt. In fact, what they'll find is Assyria is a deadly enemy. Uh, they'll find that out in about 30 years. I'm going to hurry to a close here. Uh, verse 13 and 14. Uh, the Lord used a prophet to bring Israel from Egypt. By a prophet, he cared for them. Now, who was that prophet? That prophet was Moses. God spoke through him to the people and gave them explicit instructions, and he cared for them throughout the wilderness under or through Moses, under Moses' leadership. Verse 14, but Ephraim has aroused his bitter anger his Lord will leave on him the guilt of his bloodshed and will repay him for his contempt. So so Israel or Ephraim, the northern kingdom, sin is going to be repaid. And that involves some uh, shedding of the blood of innocent and uh, their contempt and their, he's going to repay them. So they're going to be judged, but what God has made clear throughout this passage is that his love is not going to be uh, totally withdrawn from them. Uh, he speaks of a time uh, after this judgment, this pending judgment, when he's going to call them from the West. And that means from all over. Uh, we know that uh, Judah returned from ba a Babylonian captivity and they returned from the East. When it says from the West, it, it's speaking of, uh, a general return to Israel of all God's people. So, so in closing, uh, let's just review the aims again and see if we if we if we hit them. Uh, number one, compare prosperity as a worldly goal with the godly virtues of love and justice. And I know we can uh, we can be uh, too mindful of material blessings. Uh, to the point that we we miss what is most important to God, uh, and and that is uh, first of all to love Him, and to demonstrate that love through service, humble service to others. Uh, God doesn't need anything that we have. We actually show our love for Him by loving others, uh, and 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 actually He wants us to. To, to be just, to be right with everyone in all of our doings. He wants us to be right and wants us to be just. I mean, we don't have to be a justice, a judge to to mete out uh, judgment or justice. We just have to be just and right in all of our dealings and in all of our doings with, with everyone. Number two, regret occasions when one has adopted prosperity as a key goal. You know, there's an old saying that uh, we should uh, we should hold everything God blesses us with a loose hand or with an open hand. Certainly, there's nothing wrong with material blessings, but very often God blesses us to make us a blessing materially to make us a greater blessing or a blessing to others. Uh, God doesn't have any problem with us being comfortable, living comfortable lives, but he doesn't want us to forsake the poor, those who are in need, and we certainly want to keep material prosperity uh, in proper perspective. It is nothing compared to uh, the virtues that God wants us to practice daily of love and mercy or love and justice uh, in, uh, in our walk. And then finally, practice love and justice as key verses. That's what we want to do. So we pray that we have uh, gotten something out of the lesson today. And I'm sorry we went long again. We pray that God will bless you and keep you until such time as we meet again.